Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to this fun collaboration video that I am doing with Don Michelle of Boho Tarot, all about the Celtic cross. Hello, welcome back, all that good stuff. I'm so excited to get into this. I have so much to say. Um, I had actually been planning to make some kind of a Celtic cross video for a, a little bit. And it turns out that Donna's working on a video and she was mentioning to me that maybe we could do, oh no, it came up in one of her lives, that's right. She was doing one of her lives for her membership and it came up in there that maybe with this Celtic cross video, we could do it as a collaboration. And so we hopped on it, we started chatting together and decided to do it together. So you will have already seen Don Michelle's video, I hope, by the time you view view this video and there will be some great context there. If you haven't yet, I will make sure to link it in the cards so you can go watch that one before you dig into my thoughts because I will be springboarding a bit off of what Don Michelle had to say in her video and also sharing with you my own thoughts and feelings about it. And with that said, let's get into it. So the Celtic cross spread is a very long standing spread that has been used by the tarot world for a long time. I'm not gonna try to pretend I know how long because I have no idea. But when I was new to tarot, it was the first spread I ever learned and it was one that stuck. And I think, you know, the, the spread gets a lot of flack because nowadays we, the trend is to typically do a lot of smaller spreads or to kind of bash the Celtic cross spread a bit. We see a lot of people just kind of di dissing it, right? Like it's just not the spread that is at all popular to use right now, but it is a good spread. And so I really, I have a lot to say to defend it because it's it's a very comprehensive spread and whether it's the Celtic cross spread or a different spread that you wanna learn that is kind of more big and covers a variety of points, I think having a single go-to overview spread that you can use to ask answer a specific question or to give somebody a general reading because I cannot tell you how many times I have read for friends or family and they're like, I just want whatever, whatever comes up, comes up. And to try to read in that situation without some kind of spread to use as a foundation, I found really challenging, especially when I was new to tarot. So the Celtic cross has always been my go-to. It is definitely a go-to when I read in person at either events or at um, metaphysical shops. If anything, I will use the center of the Celtic cross, which I call the heart of the matter. And it is still one of my most popular readings I do for clients. Um, but I think because the Celtic cross has gotten a bit of a bad rap, people don't tend to want to book a Celtic cross reading, even though I used to have one available in my shop. So I renamed the center of it, heart of the matter, and I book it all the time. So I think that just kind of goes to show sometimes we don't know the benefit of something unless we work with it a lot. So I think it's a really valuable spread. Now I have to kind of caveat all this by saying I learned a particular version of the Celtic cross, which I think I know where I got it, but I'm not sure if it will actually line up perfectly. So I'm going to share that with you in a minute. But I learned one version and that version has stuck with me and has worked really, really well over the years. And I've made basically no changes to it. Whereas I think you'll see in Don Michelle that she got a lot more creative with the Celtic cross. And I think you'll really appreciate that perspective as well. So again, make sure you check out her video. But for me, I'm going to tell you the, or talk you through the version of the Celtic cross that I got to know and, you know, talk about the, the center, which I think the center of the Celtic cross can work all by itself, and then the additional staff, the last four cards, and what they add to the reading. Often I found this reading just performs really well. It like answers the question, it gives me the information, and it lets me dive into a number of areas that I think often illuminate what is going on for my querent. Um, and I wouldn't say I really ever do this spread for myself. It's just my go-to when I'm reading for somebody, particularly somebody who's never had a reading before. So with all of that said, and all the reasons I think the Celtic cross is pretty great, let me get into a little bit about where I think I got my first version of the Celtic cross. And I have not prepped this in advance. I haven't peeked. I think this is where I got it. We're gonna look at it together in a second. Um, and I'll let you know if I see changes. If I do see changes, I have no idea where I got my current version, but I've been using it for like 20 years. So I don't know, <laughs> but we're gonna check here first. So I believe it was in the back, yeah. So this is the guidebook for the Osho Zen Tarot, which was my first ever tarot deck, which is why I'm pretty sure this is where it came from. But yes, okay. So I do lay mine out in this way, uh, which I'll talk you through in a moment. So that part I got. Um, but the wording that I have in my head is different. Um, in several places. So I don't know, this is close. This is close. So the Celtic cross in the Osho Zen tarot guidebook 
has card one being the issue, card two being diminishing, enhancing, or clarifying slash obscuring, which is pretty close to how I see it, but I've, I learned a different term for that. Um, three is unconscious and four is conscious, which is part of the spread that I use. Five is old patterns, six is new patterns. Um, my wording again is different and I, I know I got it somewhere, I just don't remember where. And then seven is self, eight is um, what you're attracting from the outside, nine is your desires slash denials, and 10 is outcome slash key. So either my brain interpreted this a particular way and that's what stuck, or I had been working with this spread and another one and somehow blended the two over time. So let me talk you through my version and we'll do a sample reading together in the whole bit. So for this, I have, oh, whoa, we're zoomed in, sorry. <laughs> for this, I have pulled in my little Way of the Panda Baby Panda Tarot, because it's so cute. And the cards are small, so we can hopefully fit them all in the frame. So um, it's kind of funny, I was, Dawn let me see her video before I filmed mine, so I kind of knew where she was coming from in her perspective. And the way that we lay out our spread is very, very similar, which kind of cracked me up, because you often have limited space. So I'm gonna, because of this, um, because of this viewfinder space I have with the camera, I, I have limited space, so I'm gonna lay it out that way. It just kind of cracked me up. I was like, oh my God, we do the same thing. Um, it's kind of funny. All right, so I like to look at this as a general spread, which means this is a great one to do when you don't have a specific question. You just wanna know what's going on. But it's also just as good of a reading to do when you have a question. So let's think about a, um, a faux question from a faux client here. So let's say the question is, um, what do I need to know about what's happening with my work in the coming year? So that might be a pretty common question. So we're gonna use that as our sample and I'm gonna talk you through the spread positions. We'll do an overview and then we'll, we'll do each card. Now, unlike Dawn, I do lay my spread out face up. I didn't used to, but there are things I do that matter to me and why I use it face up. And again, because I'm reading for clients, I find that it's, um, it just flows better for me. So here's how I lay out and the order I lay it out. So we start with the center which I'm gonna move just to the side here, and then what crosses it. And then I lay down this third card beneath, the fourth card above. Then we do the fifth card and the sixth card. Now, if I am doing a heart of the matter spread, the reading stops here. And this is a complete cohesive reading in many situations. It's, it's perfection in a lot of ways for what I like to do. But the staff has a lot of great additional insight to offer and I think is very worth doing as well. So I'm gonna lay out the staff and like Dawn, I do lay it at an angle when I'm in limited space. So there is card number seven, card eight, card nine, and card 10. Now 10 cards is seems like a lot, um, but it is such great practice in my opinion to learn a spread and work with a spread that has this many cards because you learn to look at patterns, you learn to look at relationship between cards. There's just a lot of value in this, but this is the piece I was talking about how Don and I both lay our cards out at like this 45 degree angle. This is kind of funny. I don't do this if I've got a much bigger space or I'm not trying to squeeze it all into a photograph or a video frame, but this is definitely how I do it if I'm doing it on video um, or in a limited space. So. Let me talk through my positions. Like Dawn, I will have images to put up on the screen that show the spread positions as we're talking about them. So as soon as I lay it out like this, the very first thing I always do is I create a little space between these cards here and I move my crossing card to the right so that I can clearly see everything. Because this is really annoying when you're trying to look at something. And since I don't read with reversals, the direction doesn't matter. So this is how I would lay it out to talk through for a client. So. This was our card one, card two, card three, card four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so we start with card one, which is the center of the issue. Now, when I'm done going through this whole thing, I'm gonna take a moment and talk about what I usually will do before I even start reading card one, but for now I wanna talk through this, the Celtic cross that I do so that we, we kind of are starting from the same baseline, I guess you could say. So the center of the issue, this is what I've called the center position, the center of the issue. So this is the issue or the center of the issue or the heart of the issue. And so however you phrase it, this is the core of everything. So in this case, we were asked, we were asking the cards for our fictitious client here, 
what is the what do they need to know about their work or their job for the upcoming year? And right at the heart is the Knight of Cups. And that tells me something right away, that right away what is important to my client is not necessarily the financial achievement, although those things are probably appreciated by my client, but rather they are looking to fill their cup. They're looking to feel nourished and fulfilled in the work that they do because the Knight of Cups chases that good feeling. They're not always motivated by just money or just status. They're motivated by feeling good about what they do. So that gives me a lot of information about the situation right from jump is that this issue has to do with following or the quest for the good feeling because that is what the knight does. The knight of cups, the knights all quest for something and the knight of cups is questing for a feeling, not necessarily a tangible reward. Doesn't mean they don't like those things, but yeah. And then crossing this, so this is how I would refer to this, the, the second position is this crosses the first card for good or for bad. That's how I learned it. So this affects this either in a positive way by boosting it in some way or in a negative way and cre create some kind of obstacle or block. And here we have the judgment card. And this gives me some other really interesting information right away. The judgment card is about hearing a call. Now this tells me that this person has been feeling a pull towards making a shift. Um, perhaps they've been feeling a little bit pulled to shift career path or they've been feeling like it's time for a change on the job so that they can chase this good feeling. So something's happening. They're on the precipice of a possible change. They're, there's either one around the corner for them or there's one that they're already considering or in the back of their mind, they're already kind of aware that they need to make a shift of some kind to go after this positive feeling. So that's how I would view this second card. Then I would move underneath to this third card. And this third card position is what is unconscious? What is, one, what is not necessarily known by the client? So something that's going on that they may not be fully aware of. That's how I would express it to my client. And here we have the devil card, which tells me right away that there's something about their job that currently has them feeling really stuck, that currently maybe is not serving their greatest good. Perhaps they're doing a job that feels a little bit unethical or that isn't aligned with that feel good feeling. A good example of this might be um, being in a position that's sales driven and the kind of tactics, even very ethical, but uncomfortable tactics one sometimes uses in a sales position might be making the person feel like they're in shadow, like they're not being true to themselves in some way. So there's something going on beneath the surface that's leading to dissatisfaction on the job currently because we're really looking in the center line about what's happening right now and then we start to look at other timelines but in the center in the unconscious currently like what's sort of beneath the surface for this client is something's going on that's making it's creating disharmony they're not feeling in alignment with who they want to be or there's something something I feel like it's probably ethical um, again this is just fictitious but there's a feeling of stuckness that has to do with not being in alignment with themselves in some way and then I go to conscious and we have the Seven of Swords. And this is really interesting because beneath the surface, there's this feeling of maybe being stuck in shadow, but consciously, they literally feel like they're doing something that's not good. They really feel like there's something about their work that's putting them in an uncomfortable position to either be dishonest or to feel like they have to be dishonest or feeling like they have to pretend to be something they're not in order to be successful. There's some sort of disingenuous um, aspect to this particular job that is pulling them away from their what they like to feel about themselves on the job. Sometimes this kind of energy can come up when somebody's in a position in their job where they're forced to be competitive in a way they don't normally like to be in order to um, do well, right? So this can happen, say, in a call center environment where you're measured by statistics. And so instead of focusing on giving really good customer service, you have to focus on how long you have that person on your line. And so you have to maybe behave in ways to get them off your line that don't make you feel good. Like you don't feel like you're offering good customer service. You feel like you're treating your customers like a number. That can be an example of how you feel like you have to be dishonest on the job or like you can't be yourself or you can't be in alignment with what you want to be in order to do well. And so there's a there's a, um, a blockage for this client in the sense that they, they really feel like they can't be themselves or they really feel like they're not able to behave in a way that feels um, ethical and authentic to them. So this highlights for me the core of the issue. So they just asked me what's going on with their job over the coming year and I've already uncovered huge issues with where they're at right now as well as the idea that they're probably considering a different shift, like a different role. And this is where I really want to highlight this is exactly the kind of way that the Celtic Cross often gets right to the meat of an issue and offers really good, cohesive, clear information. I have used this spread and will always use this spread if I'm reading for somebody I sense is skeptical of tarot because I often find I get right to the meat of the issue and they feel really seen and heard and understood because the messages that come through for me when I use this spread always seem to get out what the client could not have possibly expected me to uncover, but that I do because the way that the spread is designed just gives me that great 
tool and that confidence to do it. And I will admit that part of the confidence I feel using the Celtic cross is just how well I know this spread and how many times I've used it. So I'll argue that you could probably get the same feeling from any comprehensive spread you know like the back of your hand and that you can just do no problem because you've done it so many times. So I'm sure there are other spreads that could potentially do this for you, but for me, this is the one that, that has always been that spread for me. So I feel really passionately about it. And again, like I, like I said, I know a lot of people don't like this spread or they poo poo it, but I just feel like it has so much depth and richness. Okay. So I've read for the client now what is the heart of the issue, what's affecting that for good or for bad, as well as what's on their mind consciously and what they may not be aware of. So they may be aware that they're behaving unethically because they have to in order to, to do well at the job. And let's face it, a lot of us are put in that position through different workplaces, right? And then beneath that, there's this feeling of really being trapped that, that may not be fully conscious for the client yet. They may not be fully aware. They may be loosely aware that they're look, they're kind of chasing that good feeling, but they may not know just how much stress or um, stuckness they have been feeling until you point it out to them in the reading, right? So then we have cards five and six of this center part of the spread. And here we have the Hermit and the King of Cups. And this part, the way I learned this fifth position is I learned that it was called recent past or journeys just coming to an end. That wording is memorable to me because I think when you're talking past and future, especially with somebody who's less familiar with the tarot, there can be a little bit of intimidation, especially around the future. And wording like journeys just coming to a close feels less intimidating or scary maybe, just like journeys just beginning. We're talking about timeline now and forward, but it feels less like here's what's in your future. You know what I mean? It feels less intimidating to people that may be a little bit mm, not so sure yet about tarot. And that's something else I appreciate and love about the Celtic cross is that it feels more approachable and accessible to somebody who doesn't have a tarot background. Anyway, moving on. So for my client in the recent past is the hermit. And that tells me that they were probably one of the things that was helping them to feel better about the job that they were in was perhaps they were working alone or they were working from home or they were in some situation where they weren't in direct contact with as many people, perhaps coworkers that are not so great, or that sense of like, let's say this is about competition. Maybe they were feeling less of that sense of competition because they were able to work alone um, or they were on the road or something was happening where they weren't having to interact with as many other people. And I suspect because this is in the journeys coming to a close that either this person is about to return to the office. And of course that's on my mind because of our current circumstances in the world. Maybe they're getting ready to go back to the office and they're concerned it's going to highlight more of this uncomfortable feeling or um, something about their role is changing and they're now gonna be maybe in a cubicle farm instead of in an office by themselves. And that might be the tipping point to them feeling a little bit even more unsettled about their job and not sure, not feeling as, as solid, which is why they would ask that question in the first place, right? So the Hermit card here just tells me that perhaps they are already feeling mm, a little, a little like dubious about a shift in how much alone time or work alone or work away from the office kind of time that they've had. And that's going to be changing because this is coming to a close, right? That's the information I get from that position. The sixth position is journeys just beginning or your near future, things that are coming up. And again, I don't remember where I got this wording, but it's the wording that stuck. And here we have the King of Cups. And so this is really interesting to me because it tells me we have the Knight of Cups in the present and the King of Cups in the future. Now the King of Cups is somebody who has found that feeling and is content and safe within it. And that tells me that the gears are already turning within my client's mind and in their life. They have consciously or unconsciously already undergone some of the beginning steps to make a change that will make them happier in the long run. Because the King of Cups as a future projection card is a happy, contented, emotionally satisfied kind of card. And it tells me they're going to be moving away from this kind of stuck, icky feeling they might be feeling right now into something much better. But we don't necessarily know how that's going to happen yet. We just know that that's what's coming up. And so how are we going to get from point A to point B? That's what we're probably going to dig further into in this section, as well as look at other contributing factors. But for now, I know that my client is kind of has already started to tentatively do something. Maybe they've already inquired about another position within the company, or maybe they've recently received some kind of um, notice of a job opening in their area that feels like it might be a good fit, but they haven't let themselves fully kind of go there yet, but it's coming up and it feels like they're on the path to improvement. It's just, how are we going to get there? So we don't know that yet, but we do know that if I were to just stop here, I would say, oh, I would, I would focus in on this judgment card because to me, that was an invitation to do something different. So they're kind of already aware there's something on the table, whether it's applying for a new job or they're feeling a call to leave this job and start something new and heeding this call will likely lead them to this king of cups energy. So I could stop the reading here, but we are 
exploring the full Celtic cross. So let's dive into the staff. So we start with this position at the bottom, which I learned as internal influences. So this is how you are impacting your situation, or in this case, my client is impacting their situation. And we have the magician, which tells me that internally, my client knows that they're good at their work. They know how to do good work. They have the tools they need. They probably are being more in impacted by the specific role they're in or the environment they're in. And that is what is causing all this icky feeling. But work quality wise, they're definitely fine. They know how to do what they're doing. They're skilled and they have all the tools they need to do a good job. It sounds like there's probably other factors that are impeding their sense of well being on the job, but doing the work is not the problem. That's what I would get from this card. The next position up I learned as external influences. And here we have the three of swords. Now, when I think of external influences, I think of things kind of beyond our control that are affecting us. This could be opinions and advice of other people, including me giving the reading. And I will often remind my client of that, that sometimes going to somebody for advice or getting a reading can be things that are external influences on what you do next and are a part of the, of the conversation. But in this position, we have the Three of Swords. And I tend to see the Three of Swords as a lesson learned the hard way. So it could be that there's recently been upheaval at work, which has highlighted the unhappiness. It could be that there is um, somebody that you have to deal with now that you're coming out of hermit mode that is toxic and has forced you to look at your overall happiness on the job. But there's this external sort of influence causing you, causing this whole issue with the job to be highlighted. Now, remember, when I first pulled cards, the center of the issue was only my client is chasing a good feeling. They want to feel good on the job. But as I've gone through every position, more and more has been highlighted that shows me that this job is probably not the best fit for this client. And I've discovered that by exploring each of these, these positions. So three of swords to me is like, okay, there's a definitely a feeling of maybe not betrayal, but there's definitely a feeling of something is, is brought it to the surface. There's been something outside my client's control that has increased the unhappiness level or has highlighted this feeling of maybe not being in alignment with themselves on the job. So it's kind of, sometimes I find these positions can be a little bit of confirmation or reaffirming what we found in this core. And I think these are where sometimes we find the biggest, um, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? We kind of find that this, these two positions can feel a little redundant, which could be for all I know, one of the reasons why the Celtic cross is less popular as a spread. Cause like, ah, I already figured all that out, right? Maybe that's it. But I still find it sometimes adds layers to the reading. And if it doesn't add, it at least often confirms what I've already picked up on from over here. Okay, these last two are my favorite because this position, and if I had to pick one favorite position in the entire spread, it would actually be this one because the way that I learned this card is really unique. I learned this card is your greatest hope and your greatest fear with regards to your question. And wherever I heard this from, I wish I could remember, but wherever I heard this from, it was explained in either the book or whatever I whoever told me that often your greatest hope and your greatest fear are the same thing. Like in the way that we like maybe crave that perfect for us partner, but we're also afraid of the vulnerability it takes to get them, you know, that kind of thing. And so here in a very job related question has beautifully come up the 10 of pentacles as my client's greatest hope and greatest fear. And how perfect is that for the question? So the 10 of pentacles is a card of material success and legacy, a card of being able to pass on your success to your heirs or to leave some sort of legacy behind. Often this is about material wealth and success, but it's also about stability over the long term. And so my client craves that stability over the long term. But when I'm in context with the rest of the reading, I feel like my client wants success, but is afraid of what they might have to do to get there, that they might have to stray too far from who they truly are as a person and lose this good feeling to have material success. Now we know, or I know as just a human being that that's not necessarily true. And that in my client's best interest, this is a good point at which I can talk to them about how you can merge happiness and what you do. And you can look for a job that is both fulfilling and allows you to reach your full potential from a financial position. There are ways to explore that and do that. And this could open up a conversation or a dialogue with my client about that and about how this relates to where they are on their current job. But it definitely illustrates for me that my client does want to be successful. They just don't wanna to have to go be crappy to be successful. And our final card, our final card is the, and this is how I learned it, the key to the outcome. So not the outcome, but the key to the outcome. How do we get where we want to get? And we've already determined in this position here 
the King of Cups that we're on a trajectory to be happy and comfortable over the long term. So this really does, to me, highlight how do we get there? And if I see a card here in this position that has been negative, like let's say the current trajectory is the devil. Let's say the devil was in this position. Then what we would be talking about through this reading is how to not get here. So how to get the outcome we actually want, which is usually actually in the preceding card. Here, what the client actually wants is the ten of pentacles. They're afraid of what that success might mean or how they might get there. So then this final card is about how do you get where you want to get? How do you get to your greatest hope and face your biggest fear? How do you get, how do you get there? How do you get where you need to get? And we have the Ace of Pentacles, which for me is a card about grasping onto opportunity or a gift when it's offered. And it confirms to me the vibe I had from the Judgment card, which for this client, the vibe was the Judgment card illustrated to me that there was either um, a potential opportunity for a new job or a position shift around the corner or some other, like maybe the client was already kind of subconsciously or sort of consciously thinking about maybe applying for other jobs. This to me confirms that a shift in position is absolutely in my client's best interest. It will get him closer to the 10 of pentacles and the king of cups, which my client clearly wants. And so you can kind of see working through the whole process how in a bigger spread like this, in my opinion, you end up getting more and more information that confirms and further clarifies what it is you're getting from the cards to answer your client's question or your question. I know I'm talking about this, I'm using the word client a lot because that's how I tend to use this spread is for other people, but it's the same thing if you're reading for yourself. It's like, what don't you know about your situation? What do you know? What's in your past? What's in your future? What's your greatest hope and greatest fear? And I think that wording transformed, oops, transformed this spread into something that's just really infinitely usable for me. So let's, now that we've kind of gone through every single thing, let me talk about two things. One, well, let me talk about one thing. What I do before I start going card by card like this, especially if I'm reading for other people, and then we'll do another sample reading, um, and I'll go through it a little quicker. So hopefully, <laughs> we'll see. So when I lay out cards for a client or for another person, what I do, or for myself, but I do this probably more consistently for other people because I'm just better at remembering to do it. But the first thing I do and the reason I lay all the cards out face up is I immediately look for an elemental balance or lack of balance. So I immediately try to pay attention to how many of each element do I see present on the table. Um, and I will also look for any missing elements or any elements in excess. So for example, in this reading, if I were to just sort of do a bit of a tally, we have two cups, we have two swords, we have one, two, three major arcana cards, and we have two pentacles. So the first thing that jumps out at me is that there's no wands, which tells me that what my client is dealing with right now, where they're at in this moment in time, they're missing the passion for what they do. There's no fire. There's no heat. There's no passion. There's a desire to do a good job. I'm seeing that here. I'm seeing um, a misalignment with, his, with I'm going to say his, because in my head, this was a guy. I don't know why. But so in, in my head, I can immediately see here, or in this spread, I can immediately see that there's a lack of passion for what what my client is doing in their job and there is actually a lot of um everything else is even right there's no other elemental weightiness maybe extra major arcana because we've got three of those and two of everything else but the biggest most obvious glaring thing I would notice is that there's no wands, there's no fire. And how does no fire play into this question? And so before I even dive in card by card, I would talk about that. And I would say, well, right away I'm seeing that there's a lack of fire. There's a lack of passion for what you do. You're not feeling the zest or excitement about your job. So there's a lot of going through the motions and doing what's expected, but not so much feeling like you're really fueled by passion or like you're able to stretch your wings or be creative. And those are the things that would jump out at me before I even get into any of the cards. And that's typically what I would do. And then I would do what I just did with you guys where I go card by card. So with that in mind, let's give everything a bit of a shuffle and I'll pick a different question and we'll do another sample reading. All right. So this time, let's let's ask, um, let's actually just do a general because I want to highlight how this spread can work for general. That means you've had somebody sit across from you, you a friend, a family member, or maybe just for yourself, and you just want to see whatever comes up, comes up. Let's see what the cards have to tell me today. That's it. No context, no question. All right. So let's lay out the cards and we'll see what happens. Make sure everything's in frame. And 
our last four. So here's, oh, somebody came on upside down. I don't do that. So we're gonna put them back. So first thing I'm gonna do is quickly take note of the elemental spread and I'm seeing a crap ton of wands. One, two, three, four, five wands <laughs> and two pentacles, a sword. No, wait, three pentacles, three pentacles and one sword. One, two, three, one major arcana, just a major arcana here. That's it. That's it. So no cups right away. So then I'm going to pull these open, pull these open, you know, separate them out so I can see them all really well. And I'm going to just start talking through. So in my head right away, I'm like something's going on where emotion is not really front of mind and there's a lot of heat. There's a lot of passion. So right away, I, I am immediately drawn to the fact that there is a weight of pentacles and a weight of wands and a lack of cups and only one sword. So that's going to be in the back of my head. Now, if I, if I have a question, I'll immediately be able to give feedback back to the person I'm reading for about how that elemental spread affects the question. But because this is a general reading and I don't know what it's about until I start going through the cards, I don't know how that's going to affect the reading as a, as a whole yet. So I might reserve my elemental feeling for a little further on in the reading when I get a grapple a grapple when I when I get a grasp on what the reading is going to ultimately focus on so we're going to start with the heart of the issue which is the ace of pentacles and here it's immediately like there's a gift there's an opportunity there's like an, a, a possibility of starting something there's potential and that potential is happening in my client's material realm perhaps there's been an offer of money through some kind of situation in their life perhaps there has been an offer of a gift or something else meaningful or perhaps there's been a job offer now based on everything else I see on the table my gut instinct in this case says job offer. So I feel like this client has recently been offered either a promotion um, or a shift to a different role in their work. And I know it went work in my brain, but it was the it was the cards themselves that did that. I didn't mean to read on the same topic, but that's what's jumping out at me. So I would right away say to the person I'm reading for, it looks like you've recently had some kind of opportunity or something's being brought to you where you could shift what you're doing to make money. And then I would ask them, like, does that resonate with you? Does that sound like something you've been dealing with? Assuming they said yes, I'm going to move on to the rest of the cards. Now, if they said no, I would look at this again and see what else pops out at me. That very rarely happens. So I don't have a lot of context for how that would go to kind of play it out for you. But you always want to go with the flow in that way. And a lot of my readings are done on video. So I don't have that feedback, which means I'm going with my first gut instinct no matter what. And that's proved very successful for me. But in a live situation, I would check in and, you know, make sure we don't do an entire reading on something that makes no sense to my client. Because, I mean, it could happen, I'm sure. So anyway, I would say it looks like you've had a recent opportunity. Something's come to the table where you can shift what you're doing for a living or the way you make money. But the, the thing that's kind of affecting that for good or for bad, and this is, I just continue with the conversation. The thing that continues for good or for bad is you have, or that affects that, is that you're really looking for something that's going to feel very stable. That's not necessarily going to be this like big, exciting thing where suddenly there's a whole big influx of money or responsibility, but no long-term success or long-term potential. Because to me, the Knight of Pentacles is about that long-term taking your time, eye on the prize, but not being in a hurry to get there kind of energy. And so that's what I would get from that is that they, they, they felt this opportunity come their way. They know it's there, but they're concerned about the long-term stability of that opportunity. Now, unconsciously, we have the Knight of Wands who is like, this tells me that unconsciously my client is so excited about the idea to go on uh, that this job or this opportunity or this influx rep represents an adventure, something they can go do that's really exciting to them and kind of inspiring in some way and they're really excited about that possibility in the conscious we have the three of wands which to me is about um, embarking on a new journey and tells me that probably my client has already pretty much decided they're going to say yes to this offer they have some concerns but they pretty much decided this is probably what they're going to do because in the three of wands to, in, in my experience we often see the point of the journey where the decision's been made and we're just beginning to take the first tentative steps forward no actual um, tangible steps may have been taken forward, but I, but I see that the client, at least in their mind, has already kind of decided that they, they really want to try this. In the recent past, though, we have the Two of Swords, and this is where the client can get up in their head. The Two of Swords is often about getting stuck in decision-making and, and maybe not kind of disconnected from the heart, and this might be the point at which I remember that there's no cups on the, on the table, and that maybe could 
could isolate for me that this particular client struggles with connecting with their emotion and like remembering what it is that makes them feel fulfilled and good. And they can make decisions a little bit from a more being up in their head space. And this being in the recent past means that maybe they've recently made a decision like that and kind of regretted it. So there's hesitation around jumping into this new adventure because there's a bit of fear of straying too far from their personal path. Like it's going to take them too far from themselves or like maybe perhaps that they'll regret it, that they'll think they were too hasty. So there's hesitation and fear around the, around this that I think highlights that, that the client is like, they, they are probably going to do it, but they're nervous about what that could mean. When we move into the future position, we have the 10 of wands. And so this is, remember, journey is just beginning. And the 10 of wands is very much about having taken off, taken on a lot of responsibility. And I think the client already knows that saying yes to this offer or doing this, making this shift is going to mean a whole heck of a lot of work. But this particular card and this particular image is making me feel like they still feel like it was a, it's a successful move. Like they're going to have taken on, they'll be doing more work than they were maybe doing previously. They'll be working harder, but there's a sense of like doing the work they're meant to do or being in alignment with what it is that feels good to them to do. It feels inspiring. It's maybe very um, mentally or um, creatively stimulating. So it's going to be good. It's going to be a lot. And I think that's something they need to prepare for. So I would talk them through that. And then when we move over to the staff, we start with internal influences, the two of wands. And that tells me that probably the client was at a place in their life when this opportunity came around, when they were already considering what's possible because there's got to be something different or something more, as if they were already in a bit of a restless place. And they're definitely ready for the adventure, even if it were to flop. The two of wands to me tells me that they're looking for the excitement, even if this turns out to not be the forever thing. This opportunity represents a shift and a change in course that I think they'll enjoy the process of, even if it doesn't work out for them long term. And then we have external influences, the Queen of Wands. And the Queen of Wands is somebody who is confident in what she is confident about and passionate and creative. And externally, this could mean that the person that offered him this, again, I just randomly picked a guy. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I very rarely read for guys. I don't know why guys are front of mind. They are. So... However this offer came about or this opportunity came about, the person who is involved with that opportunity, so this could be a future supervisor or um, maybe somebody who would be on the team he'd be working on if he was shifting roles, that person has a confident charisma about them that is really inspiring to my client and has a positive impact on them. Then we get to my favorite position, greatest hope and greatest fear. And here we have the three of pentacles. And this to me is classic. I want to do something new, but I am nervous about being the new kid. You know, there's that feeling of like, okay, I'm going to try something new, do something new, but I'm nervous that I'm going to just be the new kid. There's always that learning curve when you shift roles and you start doing something you haven't been doing before, but you're feeling like excited about being the new kid and having something new to learn and do, but like also scared. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what that makes me think of. And finally, we have the Magician card as our key to the outcome, which to me would be a reminder of the client that even though there's some fear about being the new kid, even though there's some fear about what it's going to take to learn the new job, that ultimately taking this new job or doing this new thing is going to give them, yes, a lot of work. They're going to be working harder than they have in the past, but they're going to feel much more good about themselves and fulfilled moving forward. And the magician card is a reminder that they have the basic skills and tools they need to succeed at the new job or the new in the new situation or on the new venture. They just need to believe in themselves and not let their insecurities get in the way. Boom. There's my reading. And yeah, in some ways it did kind of feel like a follow-up to the, my first pretend client. So if that was you, if somebody out there is like really going through this whole thing and needed like a two 10 card spread to like dive into it, I hope that was what you needed. Otherwise, I just got real in my imagination about this. I'm not sure what happened, but it really flowed. And I find that with the Celtic cross, it often really flows in this way. It becomes this really cohesive conversation. And again, I think part of that is that I know the spread so well and have worked with it so much that that could be influencing, I guess, my bias of how much I love this spread. But I do love it. And I've used it for years and years and years and years and years. And while yes, sometimes in my head even, it feels a little boring and routine because I've done it so much, it's also incredibly effective, or at least it has been for me, and therefore something that I go to again and again. And and again, if, if, if I'm just ever randomly pulling out my cards to just randomly read for somebody, like let's say I have, I have a deck in my purse and I'm meeting with a friend and they're like, oh, hey, could you give me a reading? This is probably going to be the spread I'm going to do. I love working with other spreads. I have a spread book. I have lots of different spreads I like doing for clients, but this is a go-to. 
And the heart of the matter, which is this chunk, is something I do all the time, all the time. So I really, really enjoy the Celtic Cross. I think it's worthy. I think it's a good spread. I think it's stuck around as long as it has for a reason. And I, I hope it sticks around for many, many, many years to come because I think it has a lot to offer. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to Dawn for kicking off this collaboration. This was a lot of fun. I have been dying to just chat about the Celtic Cross for a bit now, so it was really fun to kind of get into what it means to me and how I use it. And there are, as Dawn Michelle so beautifully pointed out, so many different variations on this spread and so many opinions on how it should be read. But at the end of the day, it's a 10 card spread. Like do with it what you want, change it like Don Michelle did or find a version you really love like I did or never use it because it just doesn't sound even remotely appealing to you. All of those options are completely fine. I just wanted to bring something to the conversation as a fan of the spread to talk about how helpful I think it is and how useful I think it can be. So I hope this was helpful. As always, if you enjoyed this video or you found value in it, please be sure and click the like button. And if you're new to my channel and you want to stick around and see my videos show up in your subscription feed, then hit the subscribe button and click the little notification bell and make sure you allow notifications on your mobile device if you want to get notifications when I put up new videos or when I do or when I go live for live streams. As always, thank you so, so much and may your magic always shine from the inside out. Bye guys!